Good afternoon and welcome to Lunchtime Shares, where we add value to people's lives happening every Wednesday and Thursday on ebizradio.com. You can catch the Lunchtime Shares on all major podcast channels and to help us grow the channel uh, and add more value to people's lives, please follow, like and share today's conversation. With us today, we have our marketing and leadership segment uh, joining me as per usual, marketing and communications expert and co-host Craig Page Lee. Craig, how are you doing? Kevin, great. Yeah, thanks. Um, amazing to, to be sitting here prepping our show that goes live on spring day which uh, is a great great day for us because we know summer's on its way and uh, a little review again we got 15 weeks of hard work and left ahead of us I can't. and then uh, yeah can you believe it uh, <laughs> it feels like you and i were just like like walking into the to the year just 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 the other day kind I of know. Going, sure um covid's been interesting <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, we are. <laughs> Fifteen weeks left of this. It's it's crazy, Craig. Um, yes. I mean, it's uh, 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 the part of me is like it's crazy, but part of me is like I, I could do with a holiday. Um, yes. <laughs> so looking forward to it. So, Craig, I mean, last week I enjoyed this uh, last week's show, and it was really great to be introduced to the power of audio or sonic branding, and how much this impacts our our daily lives, uh, especially when reference the, the three examples that we played on air. So, I mean, with that in mind, please, will you share a quick overview of uh, last week's conversation with the listeners? Yeah, absolutely, Kevin. Thanks. Um, yeah, I want to reference the, the article we touched on last week titled Advantages of Audio Branding as the, the source of the key takeaway points for today. And as a reminder, I came across this article on sonicminds.dk, and we learned the following from the article, Kevin. So firstly, sonic branding is a strong tool through which companies convey memorable messages to their target audiences from those little catchy snippets that we looked at um, of, of different tunes to non-lyrical sounds and, and audio branding is able to therefore take advantage of that most powerful memory of the human brain vis-a-vis -vis sound. Okay. And the three, the three advantages that we came across and noted as follows. So firstly, sonic branding triggers emotions. As you know, sound and music affect our emotional state the most, much more than visuals do, and it affects our moods and feelings and behaviors and pulses and can actually make us either feel sad, scared, happy, or affect the way that we actually think and feel and act at that particular point. And knowing this and, and knowing that most of our decisions are made unconsciously, audio brands can actually play a hugely important role in creating those meaningful, effective uh, brand communication connections, Kevin. The second point is sonic branding enhances brand recall and studies have shown that listening to sound or music actually helps correlate with the message and helps in improving the verbal memory of the audience, which leads to obviously an improved brand recall. And then the last uh, point that we picked up there is sonic branding gets more attention. So as consumers were exposed to an average of over 5,000 advertisements a day, and as we all become more engaged and consumed by digital, the number of advertisements are obviously uh, increasing in, in, in exposure. So as you all know, we've adapted to filtering out a lot of those messages, Kevin, that we are faced with daily. And on top of that, our attention spans are actually declining. So the inclusion of music, therefore, helps reinforce a brand's identity and as such helps drive attention to that prospective target audience. But I want to close with, with by quoting from probably the most important paragraph, an impactful paragraph of the article, Kevin, and it goes along these lines. The strength of audio branding also lies in its subtlety. While visual advertising broadcast through phones, billboards, and print ads can feel highly intrusive in our daily lives, audio can be consumed separately. Audio content requires less effort to follow than visual content, which explains why podcasts and other audio-first mediums are so popular. <laughs> there was method in this madness, Craig. I knew it. I knew that people would want to listen to what we have to say. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Craig, so, I mean, thank you. And that's a good summary of it. Guys, if you want to catch that, you can check it out in the Lunchtime series on YouTube. Um Every week we, we we sort of tie well Craig sort of tie this to uh, tie the, ties all of this information together for us so go and check it out really really some interesting information to share but uh, Craig with that said um, what are we what are we going to chat about today 
Yeah, Kevin, I, I want to investigate uh, another angle to the topic of, of brands, marketing, and, and consumers today. It's been a bit of a theme the last two, two to three weeks. Um, moving from the, the great conversation on Sonic or sound branding last week to that of direct to consumer uh, marketing and, and sales, are more commonly known as D2C. So I know you've mentioned the term a few times before, and but yeah. glad to be learning about the subject, and we've we've not covered in detail before. So on that note, what can you share uh, on D two C? Yeah, Kevin, thanks. Um, yeah, we haven't actually uh, covered the topic in detail before. So yeah, another another good revelation of learning for me um, in in the insights as well. So keeping to my regular introductory approach, let's start by looking at a few of the definitions of the term direct to consumer. Um, it is, however, worth noting that there are actually quite a vast array of, of varying definitions, but in general, the essence of what D2C is remains the same. Bluecart.com informs us that all direct to consumer brands sell products directly to buyers online without take note without involving retail stores or a distribution network. So instead of a browsing uh, uh, retail sites like Target or Walmart, buyers can go directly to your company's website, purchase the items and get them shipped right away. According to BSScommerce.com, DTC stands for direct to consumer. It is a sale model that happens when a manufacturer decides to sell products directly to the consumer without having distributors or retailers as third parties in the process. According to ASWDouble.com, D2C stands for business to consumer and refers to goods or services sold by a business to an end customer. However, D2C stands for direct to consumer. In simple terms, it means that the orders are actually fulfilled and shipped directly to that end consumer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in closing on the definitions, Kevin, um, I came across an interesting article on in, in incensepro.com, which highlights an important reality in that direct-to-consumer marketing actually has been around for decades, from, from the likes of, believe it or not, mail-order purchases to brands like Avon, which you know, in many quarters is actually known as pyramid schemes to some. But <laughs> yeah. in reality, DTC brands theoretically have full control over the entire process from making a successful product and building a loyal customer base to shipping the items and attracting new customers via digital marketing. Okay. Uh, as you're talking through this now, one of the things that sort of stand out for me is some, some brands have used uh, uh, D2C as a, as a marketing ploy or a, a shift into, uh, you know, getting a different segment of the market a market to kind of buy into their brand right correct yes so so d2c and that's a really good point to make actually because d2c doesn't mean that the brand in question is exclusive to an e-com platform only there are certain d2c brands that have operated through distribution networks and and, and retail channels and i think a, a fine example of that would be say for instance nike Nike has a really good Nike.com direct uh, uh, proposition and, and they're hugely successful in that regard. But we've seen them in parts of the world where they actually have their product available through foot lockers uh, and, and other aggregators, sports uh, um, sites in South Africa, total sports and places like that. So they would use a retailer distribution channel to reach a particular segment, but at the same time, they have a direct mechanism now. On the point of Nike, what we're seeing in the USA is Nike are actually extracting their product from a lot of those uh, retailer distribution channels like Foot Locker. Um, and, and they see substantial increase in profitability because they're actually stripping out a lot of cost as well in, in being able to go direct to, to their consumer. Kevin, so yeah, really, really good point you make there yeah and i was just and because uh, i've been like thinking of like some of the conversations we've had around even through what types mm. of marketing you're using and what types of channels you're using um how you're selling your 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 brand or what what you know what your product way how you're showcasing your product uh this could be just another tactic to kind of go actually why are we not doing this directly to to consumer um, and it's, you know, it, it's a nice sort of frame and a, a nice sort of process to, to kind of go, well, it, um, it's a, it's a, it could be a, a tactic that you use to, to increase business.
so, so, so the the combination uh, um, between bricks and mortar and and digital really is where where the growth is. And interesting to see that if if one looks at the likes of um, you know, you know, e-commerce sales in in twenty twenty in the USA sitting at around one hundred and two point six billion. Of that, 338 percent was actually G two C brands, Kevin, mm-hmm. um, with you know a huge percentage. When when you're looking at a projection into twenty twenty four, that thirty three point eight percent change is is going down to sixteen point six percent, and you're actually seeing an upward lift in, in brick and mortar again. So more of the traditional established brands in a retail mortar environment are taking head on the the predominantly digitally native uh, um, DTC brands. So we're definitely seeing a, a shift and the, the combination strategies are, are really the ones to win at the end of the day, Kevin. Greg, so, I mean, you've already mentioned Nike. What, um... <laughs> What other names can you uh, sort of share with us that are direct uh, direct to consumer brands? Yeah, Kevin. The, the, you know, to state the obvious, the yeah, e-commerce removed all traditional barriers to connecting uh, directly with consumers, and as you know, this was primarily driven uh, as as a key channel during the COVID pandemic, um, of offering not only lower cost but in some instances actually better experiences and such. Many brands have adopted the DTC model, uh, whether established or new. So. At the outset, there are about 22,000 direct-to-consumer brands currently operating, Kevin, which is quite substantial. And and many of them are on the accessories, clothing, lifestyle goods, and apparel-based categories. And about one in five DTC brands actually are cosmetic or beauty product brands. Uh, most of the well-known DTC brands are from the USA. And whilst the list is extensive, we've already picked up on Nike. One could look at the likes of Adidas and 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 Crocs, for instance. Uh, they're very much active in those environments. The broader list of, of brands does include the likes of Smile Direct Club, which really fascinating uh, brand where, where they're in the dentistry space, um, often in teeth uh, aligners and whiteners. To Happy Fire, a brand that I've come across in, in, in the... Uh, a COVID period, which is really promoting healthy habits and positive thinking. So quite unique brands in these particular DTC territories. To Fisher Price, a brand that we all grew up with as, as youngsters, toys developed to help uh, uh, grow children's brain capacity. And then Manscaped, uh, a brand that we've seen quite prevalent these days, men's grooming products. So, and, you know, those are just a few. What, what are the two brands that you're going to expand on, Craig? Okay, Kevin. So Warby Parker and Dollar Shave Club. Have you heard of any of those? I haven't, no. You haven't? Okay, I'm surprised you haven't. So, so quick intro. Warby Parker is a successful American eyewear DTC brand founded in 2010. And interestingly, Dollar Shave Club, which is a male grooming brand founded by Michael Dubin, was also founded in 2010. So I want to reference the article, Six Direct-to-Consumer Brands to Learn From Top DC DTC Brands. Um, published by Nicole Georgi on bluecock.com. And the, the article provides some great context to the success behind these DTC brands, Kevin. And, and it provides a great overview of, of a threefold approach. One being the problem that the brand category was faced with. Two being the solution that the brand actually developed to respond to that, that, that opportunity. And three, some of the key differentiators of success driven uh, um, allowing them to be recognized as, as leading B2B brands. So this is what we learned. To start off with Warby, Warby Parker is well positioned as a D2C pioneer. Um, as noted earlier, being founded in 2010, the business disrupted the industry totally entrenched in traditional retail, that being eyewear. And the problem here was that eyeglasses were way too expensive and 80% of the high-end eyewear was designed and manufactured by one single company, Luxottica, and predominantly a B2B company. And it owned other brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Lenscrafters, Pearl Vision, and Sunglasses Hut. So immediately you can see the captive audience that it had. So the only option when purchasing eyeglasses was paying hundreds of dollars at your respective optometrist's office. And this is because Luxottica had a near monopoly over the industry and had some price regulation in place as well. So everyone was forced to pay for Luxottica's key licensing fees and therefore marked up their products to support their uh, retail distribution and, and, and display costs. So the solution here was that Warby Parker realized the expense of supply chain 
business was holding everyone hostage. So what they did is they opted for some vertical integration as opposed to the horizontal integration. They're able to therefore own or control their own supply value chain. So the designers were able to own their frames, immediately remove the expense of licensing fee, which was then passed all the way down uh, to, to end consumers. And they were able to source their own raw materials and inventory, further reducing third-party costs in the supply chain. Expenses, again, which were passed all the way down to consumers. And most importantly, they actually started selling their products directly to consumers through their digital storefronts or, or e-commerce sites. So this approach not only removed those expensive costs of retail display, storage, etc., but also allowed Warby Parker to control 100% of the customer experience and, and in a DTC environment, that's really where you're going to either hook in or, or lose the consumer entirely. Customers could select up to five frames, receive them in mail, choose the one that they wanted after the trial period, then submit their final order online and ship the, the remaining frames back. And all of that was included in a single purchase price. The glasses could be returned or exchanged within a 30 day period as well. And, um, you know, they had well-designed e-commerce packaging and the e-commerce shipping was, was quick and convenient, uh, convenient as well. So selection, price points, ability to return, good packaging and a really effective e-commerce uh, platform there. So one of the biggest benefits there, Kevin, in, in, in this DTC business model is the customer experience team. And Warby Parker were able to engage directly with customers, gathering extensive feedback and, and customer analytics capability to drive behavior in real time, which meant that they could react on data marketing and improving the, the customer experience um, in real time. Craig, and I, that's, I mean, when you were talking now, I was like, that's probably the point that stands out for me is taking control of that 100% custom experience. Because when you're, when you, you know, bypassing all the, um, the expenses of having a change by a chain based business, um, and you really have more control over, you know, what the, the experience is that the client will experience and, and it's direct. I know personally of, uh, <laughs> someone who's who pays an absolute fortune to to go to the Maldives every year, and uh, it's 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 it. I mean, going to the Maldives is is an absolute fortune, and he does it every year. But the price and the experience of what he gets because of that experience, he's like, well, it's like going like it's heaven on earth, right? But it comes back to that 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 that, that taking taking back that customer experience, and, and we've we've discussed that to death already <laughs> on the importance of customer Absolutely, experience. Absolutely, Kevin. Really, yeah. really important. Yeah. So so moving on to the Dollar Shave Club, and 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 again, um, yeah. Surprised that you haven't heard of this either, because it is an incredible business. It really is. So the problem here was that. Gillette held around 70% of the razor market for decades. And we know going into any retail store, you've got to bond your house to buy a pack of razor blades. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> and as a frequent shaver over the age of 35, um, most of us realize that the razor itself really is, in, in, in essence, that handle isn't the expensive proposition. It's the blade. I just want to point out, I might not have heard of them because I don't really shave, Greg. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> this is true. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. We'll we'll forgive you on that one. Thank so, you. But just to, to reiterate, the razor itself isn't the expensive thing. It's 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 the blades, and and they are outrageously expensive. And you know we see constant price gouging in this this particular area. So Michael Dorbin, who was an unemployed digital marketer, he founded uh, Dollar Shave Club, and he actually appeared in their first viral commercial as well, saying the following. And do you think the razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome as Dr. Doc Doc grandfather had one blade and polio. Stop paying for shave tech that you don't need. And you know what? What a wise man. Because when you take the complexities and extraneous layers out of that, you end up with a principal functional handle and a good, cost-effective, easy-to-replace blade. So yeah. the blades were then, yeah, 
always kept behind unlocked uh, plastic cases in pharmacies and supermarkets because of this desirability and the high price point. Um, and another unfortunate side effect there is, is that, you know, everyone was held hostage by one company in the traditional retail environment. And, and the, the, yeah, physically asking someone to get stuff for you was a bit of a pain in the ass. And, it, and I, I still see that happening in many retail stores today where you have the checkout point and somebody has to go and get that pack of, of blade replacements. So what what everything about the traditional retail model for razors actually was totally unrealistic and, and unideal. So the solution here was to sell simple razors and blades directly to people through the dollar uh, um, DTC subscription model and bringing in the subscription model here was key, providing consumers recurring deliveries only on the number of blades that they needed. So you've got to understand the strength of the blade, how frequently you needed to replace it, and you bought your subscription model for a period of time and you just knew on a particular day the, the, the package would arrive. So shavers are well aware that shaving is a simple activity and they actually don't need shave tech at the end of the day. What Dollar Shave Club did here was help reduce the supply chain costs and pass all of those savings directly to their customers. So here again, you see cutting out multiple layers in the supply chain and passing the value back to customers. And again, just being that, one, you know, just because you're tweaking and thinking differently, coming up with your own solution and focusing on what, what it is you're selling, you're, you disrupt, he completely disrupted an industry, right? I, I just, I love that kind of approach. And we've, we've had some guests on the shows that, that have done this. Um, yeah. and, and we've seen some brands really outshine other brands based on the fact that they've really disrupted the status quo. Uh, and that's, I think that's brilliant. I think I love that. So, uh, <clears throat> Craig, based on what you've shared, are you saying that if brands strip out their distribution costs and slightly modify their business model, they're inevitably going to win over their traditional bricks and mortar B2C competitors? Yeah, Kevin, a great, great question. And we did touch on this earlier with, with one of your previous questions, just relative to the, the combination there. But, but the overview of what these two leading D2C brands did seem simple enough to replicate. Unfortunately, not all DTC brands have managed to achieve that. And, and the DTC brands are definitely coming under severe pressure again from the traditional legacy company uh, competitors, Kevin, and, and, and for a number of reasons. And, and those are covered quite well in the article titled Research, How Legacy Companies Are Beating DTC Brands. Um, the points are covered quite succinctly in the article published on the 31st of May 2022 by Sarah Mooney, staff writer at DTC Insider. Um, and the article was found on MediaPost.com. Again, great source of information for those interested. And what we learned from, from the article on the post of Netflix, which was the eMarketer report, is that DTC companies are clearly losing the edge even faster than many thought as legacy companies are surpassing them in branding savvy by branding, savvy, scale, and smarter omni-channel solutions. And again, we've spoken about omni-channel ad nausea here as well. What's interesting is, is Andrew Lutzman, the, the principal analyst at eMarketer, believes that the specific skill differential has actually accelerated that it will become a lot harder for the digitally native brands, which inevitably are the younger, newer D2C uh, e-commerce brands, inevitably harder for them and their businesses to acquire new customers and achieve profitability. And a key prohibitor in this regard is that the cost of advertising is just ratcheting up, Kevin, and, and social media continues to rise. Costs of social media continues to rise at, at unprecedented rates. And these, these digitally native DTC brands just cannot keep up. They don't have the profitability to, to ensure their brands are at, at the forefront and top of mind in advertising. We also learned from the report that at the start of the DTTC trend, young companies were able to navigate through three phases. Number one was getting attention and differentiating themselves. Number two was entering um, a land and expand cycle. And number three was then trying to make the transition into an enduring brand. But obviously the reality meant that DTC brands at a particular point had to start looking to third party retailers for the broader audience because their ability to reach audience on low budget was quite narrow gauged and they needed this broader audience again to help move products so unfortunately there was an inversion in 
in their business model, making it much harder for them to earn uh, on each sale made. Added to this, the established brands actually have consistent sales. They have well-entrenched brand stature, the likes of Nike, Adidas, etc. And they're definitely finding more ways to move uh, to a combination of owned e-commerce and store strategy, as I mentioned earlier. And that this, this process gives them a lot more profitability and obviously more control over their brands, both within that retail footprint through to that uh, end-to-end digital environment as well, Kevin. But while the D2C model actually is still growing faster than average e-commerce, the growth is waning. And, and total e-commerce sales started to moderate during the pandemic, and they are slightly expected to rise um, over the year ahead from, from 155.69 billion uh, in 2022 to 212.9 billion in 2024. DTC brands, on the other hand, have had very little impact on those totals, with only 1.4% of DTC companies topping the 100 million rand in annual sales. And and that's, that was quite alarming to note. And even fewer of those niche DTC brands are able to achieve 50 million US dollars um, turnover annually. So to find more customers, DTC brands really have to learn uh, and, and, and adopt the two tactics that they've ignored previously, advertising on traditional media and acquiring customers through physical retail stores. So we're seeing the traditional companies that have learned from those DTC brands actually now adopting some of their principles, specifically in, in data use and differentiating customer experiences and applying that into their methodologies. But in doing so, they continue to beat the D2C companies with their superior brand building skills. And, and they're putting a lot more investment into their brand awareness, advertising, and leveraging the, the physical retail stores, Kevin. Yeah. Craig, so, I mean, as we close the show today, what are the key takeaways that you can share with the, around this conversation? Because it's, I think it's quite a necessary uh, contemplation and consideration if you, yeah. if you are looking for a bit of a tactic to, to, to leverage your business. Yeah, very much so, particularly in light of the fact that there was some strength in a particular strategy for these young digitally native startups who who actually have had some of their lunch stolen through the methodology and business adaptation by by the bigger brands. So I want to reference one of the blog posts we covered today for, for the key takeaway, Kevin. So published on bluecott.com by Joshua Weatherwax, the article titled Direct-to-Consumer Sales what is direct to consumer sales? A bit of a parody there. And it provides a few key points relating to the benefits and disadvantages of, of direct to consumer sales. So there are three key advantages that I want to talk about to start with, Kevin. And quoting directly from the article, we read that direct to consumer business has never been more prevalent than it is today. Valid point. The rise of the internet has allowed manufacturers, production companies, individuals, and more to sell their products without having to go through the middleman. Another valid point, but it's not all upside. So the three key benefits of direct-to-consumer sales to consider if you want to play in the space are firstly this, benefit of higher margins. So the biggest direct benefits uh, in this particular instance is that the profit margins are much higher than selling and shipping through resellers. That means your overall revenue is higher and you can price your products competitively without having to worry about losing sales as much. This is especially true if your chosen niche doesn't have a lot of competition, so you get to accept you get to set those expectations from a price and profit margin point of view. And and it's important to understand if you do have a niche opportunity. The second advantage here is control over branding. So rather than relying on the reseller, resellers to define the narrative for your products in their environment, you're actually in charge of your public image from the start. So whether you consider yourself a top class brand, a speciality operation or a low cost, a low cost uh, option, you're actually setting those expectations for your customers through your e-com marketing and advertising efforts. And this also benefits your customer service team as, as the brand starts will be well-defined and easy to explain to customers. What you need to do is, is, is strive to have a direct relationship and that open line of communication with your customer through the entire experience journey. And then the third benefit, Kevin, here is it's easier to shift course in the D2C space. So since you're in, 
interact directly with your end user, you have much better access to feedback. And instead of waiting to uncover the issues uh, when demand planning comes along based on stock reseller levels, et cetera, et cetera, you can actually immediately respond to those complaints or suggestions to keep those sales coming in. However, there are there are some disadvantages, and the article looks at two clear disadvantages, Kevin. Firstly, here is there's no cost sharing as a disadvantage. And one of the benefits of working with intermediaries is that you can actually share your overhead and expenses and other costs to allow everyone to maximize their, their margins. So the likes of warehousing, e-com fulfillment, uh, um, software, uh, yeah, m more of that would fall on your shoulders if you own the value chain, but when you're sharing it, you're able to dissipate some of those costs. And that means that it's vital that you stay on top of your finance if, if you're going to succeed purely as a DTC brand. And, and those costs directly impact your ability to, to make and fulfill orders. The other, the other disadvantage is much larger teams are required. Since you're responsible for so many aspects of the business in the DTC sales model, you'll need to hire more salespeople and train them yourself. Whereas if you don't have prior experience or have too much on your plate already, that can definitely be a, a key challenge to your success, Kevin. So try to surround yourself with, with talented people that you that you trust and are able to you know, lean on each department and keep the, the retention rates high, Kevin. And the final point to consider here is, is that it can be hard to know where to start and how to get your DTC sales off the ground. So application of the three simple principles and understanding the three challenge uh, the two challenges um, really can help you on your way to success but stay focused on your brand highlight what makes your brand unique and leverage this to drive more DTC sales and and grow your business Kevin but but just you know bricks and mortar is winning you have to be very aware of that and and the difficulty for for digitally native brands is is knowing how to scale into that brick and mortar territory. It's an incredibly expensive space and, and really conflicts hugely with the cost cutting nature and benefit of, of a DTC uh, and paradigm. And those are the key takeaway points for today, Kevin. Fantastic, Greg, I love that you mentioned that larger teams needed is also a negative because uh, one of the futurists on TikTok recently, I saw someone speak about, you know, what the future of business looks like. And uh, one of them were mentioning that People are, are really starting to see that uh, corporates are really scaling down where they can have smaller teams and you could be re working remotely. You could be doing stuff, uh, you know, from, from your bedroom, from your study in your house um, and sort of outsource, you know, information. So um, there, there, there will be. And I think depending on what market uh, and what product you sell, uh, it will really dictate whether you're going to be directly selling to, uh, you know, uh, customers um, or you're going to sort of have an online business. It's depending on what, what it is you're selling, which is, it, it makes a unique sort of uh, sort of way of where we're heading. Absolutely, Kevin. Just, yeah, D2C guys really need to understand how to turn that quick growth into a sustainable business, as simple as that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that, do you have a TikTok account yet, Craig? I do. I've never posted anything, but I obviously use it to, to, to stay up to date with, with the trends and understand how it's been used as a medium. So yes, I, I definitely do. Okay, good. So I'm going to, I'm going to find you and then I'll share all of my TikToks with you so you can see what, the, what I'm seeing and we can have, we, you're at the Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Guys, if you want to find out more about uh, what we do, it's every Thursday uh, where Craig and I have these conversations and uh, we, uh, uncover and unwrap uh, some really interesting conversations uh, around marketing and leadership. And uh, you can catch us live every Thursday on ebuzzradio.com. So, Craig, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me. And uh, I will chat to you next week. Yeah, I look forward to it, Kevin. Have a great week ahead. Thanks. Uh, you too. Bye.